Welcome back to the IoT for All podcast, Matt. Thanks for being here. My pleasure. Glad to uh, to be here as ever. Yeah, it's great to have you. And for our audience context, I'm sure they probably were whoever listens to this episode will probably say, "Hey, we just we just heard from Matt." And and the idea we we've, we've kind of discussed is trying to have him on every quarter or so, depending on schedules. But the work that you're doing to kind of really get a grasp on what's happening in the industry and how it's changing, going to events as as where you are now, talking to people and those kinds of things. I think it's good just to have a more regular cadence of discussion, just to kind of keep the the, the audience up to date on on how the industry is progressing and where things are going. So so we'll dive into that here in a bit. But, but for our audience who might not be as familiar with you and, and, and the company, can you talk a little bit more about kind of your background experience and uh, introduce the company a bit to them? So my company is Transform Insights. Uh, we've been going about four years. We're a boutique research consulting firm focused on, well, I'd say probably 80% of what we do is IoT. The other 20% is looking at some other disruptive technologies, most of which is, is looking at AI. Let's face it, everybody has to look at AI nowadays, right? So that's, uh, that's pretty much a, a given. But particularly, we're interested in the kind of intersection between IoT and AI, and 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 we're also looking at a bunch of other disruptive areas around uh, blockchain or around edge compute, a bunch of other things like like that. Uh, and just my uh, personal background: so I've been an industry analyst for about twenty five years, something like that, and most of that's been focused on on IoT. So I think I'm pretty uh, pretty deep in the weeds on the on the old IoT space and. Uh, and, and I think that's um, part of what we've always tried to do at, at Transform Insights and Makina Research. My my previous company before that was sort of get immersed in the space rather than kind of watching from the uh, from the outside. So that's uh, it's always always generally been our our approach. So we spend a lot of time at, at trade shows, more on which later I'm sure, um, and spending t- face time with them um, with the the clients and the various other interesting players in the, in the IoT space. So yeah, we'd like, to be, we'd like to be deep in it. I wanted to talk about what you just mentioned regarding IoT and AI and how they're coming closer together. And I think we've been talking about that for a while now um, through many of the conversations that I've had on the podcast, just about the value they both kind of play to each other. And when you think about in order for AI to work well, you need data. And where do you get data from the physical world? Sensors in the IoT space. So um, it, let's start with MWC because that was, um, since you're at Channel Partners right now, w- what was kind of the big takeaways from MWC? How was the event? Um, how have you seen the conversations and, and boosts and, and talks around AI and IoT? Is that, st- is that, was that pretty prominent, um, for the event or, or what other things kind of stood out to you there? Well, I think every year at Mobile Congress, so this was year 18, I think, for me at that show. So I, uh, I pretty much have to, have to go every year. And, and I love it. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a great show. It's a fantastic opportunity to uh, spend four days, say four days, actually. It kind of bleeds over into, into a day before and a, and a day after at this stage. But, um, but it's essentially four, four solid days sitting in rooms with lots and lots of people talking about uh, all sorts of things. And it always gives you some fresh perspectives on things and, um, and you get to kind of bounce ideas between various different players. So it's, it's an absolutely critical one for us. And, you know, I, I wouldn't miss it on it and end up that as a, as a show, but it's quite interesting watching it evolve. Every year there is a buzzword that everybody has to do a find and replace on their, on their screen printing for their, for their, uh, uh, collateral on the, on the stands or for the big banners, right? So this year it was definitely generative AI. In previous years, it's been sustainability or it's been IoT or it's been 5G or it's been, you know, some other uh, other uh, hot new topic. So there's, there's kind of a bit of a find and replace going on, which is which is kind of funny to, to, to watch. Um, but, but the telecom space certainly looking very closely. And it's a telecom show, right? It's a mobile show. So there is a, a lot of interest in, in, in AI, but mostly it's kind of operational, right? It's kind of to do with how you're running your, uh, your customer care programs, how you're, you know, what you're doing with chatbots, um, uh, and, and more fundamental to the telecom space, what you're doing about, uh, network management and a variety of other things like that, right? So it's kind of the conversations are all how uh, telecoms is a vertical that's also using AI rather than really how the, the companies that are involved, involved in the space are actually kind of serving AI and supporting AI. 
and the, and the the conversations were were similar on the IoT side of things. You know, people looking at how you can use more forms of automation to drive out costs. Uh, how you can use automation in in terms of um, better threat identification on the sort of security side of, of, of things, um, which is all very useful. But it's kind of how do I take AI and use it to do my more or less my business as usual, uh, but in a in a more efficient manner. And I think that sort of misses a, a, a trick a little bit, which is that actually. AI and IoT are, and I've probably spoke about this on the podcast before, AI and IoT are, are, are very closely linked. And as, as you said, it's producing a lot of the data that you might be applying the, the AI to. But at the same time, there's also a question of well, where do you run the payloads within the, uh, the network? How do you manage the resources? Where, where does the, the compute function sit? How do, you, how do you handle all of those different elements of the, of the sort of AI stack, I, I, I suppose, and it's incumbent on the companies that are supporting um, IoT to think about, well, if I'm connecting a video camera, where do you want processing for that to sit? Do you want to sit, sit on, the, on the device itself, or do you want it to sit on some kind of edge node at the edge of the network, or in, in fact, some, some place in between, or some place further up towards the, the, the cloud? And how do you manage the, the various resources between those? And those conversations I more or less didn't have. I, so it, it's, it's all, all been about how you can use AI for a, a AI to your, your existing uh, processes rather than what it means more broadly. But, you know, the, that's the, it's the low hanging fruit is that, um, you know, shaving some costs off the, um, bottom line or, uh, uh, quite the right expression is it, but shaving some costs off to improve the bottom line. Um, and so, uh, it, it's that rather than how does AI make a fundamental shift to how, how everything, uh, how everything works. Um, there's a few companies that, that are, that are talking about the, those kinds of things. The company called Telnix, which does IoT connectivity as part of an, an offering that involves a whole stack of other, um, capabilities around uh, managing data flows and I'm overly simplifying and they'd probably be horrified by the way I'm, I'm describing it. But the, um, the, the, the thing is, okay, they, they recognize that it's going to be all of this AI payload that's got to be happening somewhere and you've got to manage the relationships and you've got to have some kind of uh, offering that includes the compute and the processing and, uh, of, of that, of that data bundled in as part of a, uh, an offering. So that's the kind of the AI piece. The one question I guess that a lot of people have been having is when people and companies are talking about AI, utilizing AI, um, you're right. The, the low hanging fruit seems to be the, the easy, the easy wins for companies in order to improve operational efficiency and, and eliminate potentially costs and be due to task resources that were, that had to be done manually can now be done with an AI uh, tool. Uh, well, one of the things I think happens a lot, and I'm curious how you saw this at the event, People were basically, it seems like in their marketing language, really just trying to fit in AI anywhere they possibly can, just not to be left out. But in reality, not everybody's offering an AI solution. Did you ever get that vibe while you were at the event, seeing companies who said they were doing AI, but really, in your mind, aren't doing AI? It's kind of the same thing that companies have been doing for a while. Or um, how have you kind of seen that perception? Because I think that's where a lot of people are getting confused, really looking for AI solutions, but also getting caught up in in times working with companies who really aren't doing AI, but say they are because it's it's a nice buzzword at the moment. Yeah, yeah completely. It happens it happens all the time. I think the bigger tech companies tend to be a little bit more guilty of it than, than maybe the um, the IoT focused folks. Okay, so um, I spent most of my time with the platform providers and the connectivity provider and the device vendors and all of these kinds of kinds of guys on, on the IoT side of things. And they're they're much less guilty of that than than uh most I, I think. But if you look at um more broad based technology vendors, yeah, there's a there's a, a tendency to sort of throw AI into the into the mix and sort of hope some of it stick. In the same way that we saw that with IoT back in the back in the day, back maybe five years ago, they all th- 10 years ago, they uh, kind of felt like they needed an IoT message 
regardless of whether there actually was a really an IoT uh, capability in there. So, I, you know, nothing changes much in the in this in the space in that in that respect. There's always a element of um, wanting to be perceived to be doing the, the 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 hot new thing. It also does force these companies over time to actually have to back up what their claims are and 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 really support those types of things. Otherwise, people will start to realize who the real players are and who are not. Uh, just like you mentioned with the IoT space, a lot of companies are saying, oh, we have, you know, they maybe were a software development company that all of a sudden say, hey, we can build IoT solutions. But it's it's a different kind of beast at times building an IoT solution than it is just building, you know, a piece of custom software for somebody. One of the things that we're doing now, uh, n- not me really, some more some of the some of the other guys, I've kind of got my work cut out on the on the IoT side of things, but one of the one of the tasks that we're we're taking on is really to kind of dig into this AI ecosystem and understand who all the players are, who does what with whom, who's actually relevant, and and try and remove some of this sort of opacity from the from this AI vendor landscape. But it's not just about vendors; it's the whole it's the whole ecosystem really, and and understand what that actually looks like, who's buying what from whom. And how can companies position themselves actually to to get into this uh, this AI space? I think that's a a, a fascinating thing. And in fact, very similar to to what I'm trying to do here at at this event that I'm at at the moment. Nice segue, right? Into this, uh, into talking quickly about this channel partners event, right? He kept asking me about channel partners, about channel programs and indirect and how you get out out there. And there's there's a massive focus on that. In, in IoT at the moment because uh, everybody's looking at ramping up their go-to-market just to try and, well, sell a bunch more stuff, right? I mean, that's the, not a too fine point on it. And lots of people ask me, what do you think the opportunity is in the indirect channel through all the various resellers, value-added resellers, managed service providers, all of these kinds of, kinds of players? And I had to confess, you know, I, it's not really space I, I i looked at a, a huge amount you know I, I knew it a little bit but i i wanted to to um to kind of get grips with it and that's why it came over here because there's a whole lot of um opacity there as well there's a there's probably 20 different descriptions of companies that sort of sit in this indirect space whether it be uh, managed service providers or value resellers or distributors or there's a, you know there's a whole stack of these players and what I wanted to get a handle on was, okay, well, actually, who's doing what and where with whom, and specifically in the in, in the context of uh, of IoT, to be able to identify who actually represents an opportunity to get to 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 sell into the uh, into the end user, because most of the, at, at the end of this string of different channel players. There is a company that probably has some requirement for IoT and how are they best being served. Um, and in that respect, it's, it's an interesting exercise to come here and sort of work, work out how to hang different companies and different uh, roles on certain pegs to be able to say, okay, these companies handle billing and these companies are actually uh, fulfilling on on delivering various, various pieces. So we've kind of the, the the approach I'm taking is kind of tease that out and work out what everybody's doing and, and how they're doing it. And in that respect, it's it's a very interesting show because it it kind of sits between um, between the two extremes of of uh, trade shows. You know, one of the other questions we always get is which trade show should we be uh, promoting ourselves at? Right, and the, typically there's two types. One is that the uh, is the sort of horizontal IoT shows or or telco shows, you know things like Mobile Congress, but then a whole, whole bunch of other IoT specific shows, and that's quite heavily skewed towards it being ecosystem talking to ecosystem. Whereas at the other end of the of the spectrum, you've got the the vertical shows, things like uh, there's the Hims show going on in in uh, Orlando this week, which is a healthcare show. I wanted to try and get across between the two, but it kind of proved impossible to do. But there's that, and there's, there's all, all sorts of shows related to whether it's retail or automotive or utilities. Uh, we had uh, one of our guys with a distributor a couple of weeks ago, right? So there's advantages and disadvantages to, to, to both. 
Um, one is, are there really any buyers at these horizontal shows and at the vertical shows? How many of those people are actually interested in IoT, right? So, but somewhere in between this channels uh, uh, approach or this channels event, it's very horizontal because everybody's talking about all sorts of ICT products and, and it, it's, uh, you know, the, the, the vendors in the space are doing all sorts of things. But the, um, uh, but they are definitely the kind of companies that are actually dealing directly with the customers. And so you sort of get this opportunity to sell to people or get yourself in front of people who actually are potentially able to sell your, your product to, to other people. So in that respect, it seems like a pretty, pretty interesting, uh, interesting show. Sorry, at that point, I've, I've kind of rambled on and, and spanned across multiple shows and multiple topics. Uh, you, you might want to, uh, to, to, to keep me honest a little bit now. The IoT industry as a whole, we've always struggled with the fragmentation of the industry and requiring different companies that focus on different areas, whether it's the hardware, the connectivity, software, security, to come together to bring a solution to market. And for the longest time, it was always about how do you piece those together correctly to provide a solution that actually solves a real problem. It you know went from everyone having a platform to everyone kind of having a vertical platform to everyone finally starting to see that these more point solutions are probably the way uh, way forward. But all the different pieces need to be thought out, planned out, and ready for a potential buyer. Obviously, there's levels of customization at times. Environments are different. Use cases are different. But for the most part, you've got to be able to at least know kind of what you're building and who you're building it for. And under seeing how that is now coming more to the forefront in discussions and the realization by companies say, hey, we have to be part of an end to end solution in order to really have the best chance at reaching scale is something that aligns really well with what we are doing and, and our focus over these next coming months. Um, because we feel like that's always been an area that's it's struggled. Companies will say, okay, I understand what IoT is. I can see how it can provide value. But what can it do specifically to solve these problems at a cost that is affordable uh, for the organization? And it's it's been a struggle for for a lot of organizations. Um, they all say they can they have a platform that can do all these different things and build anything you need, but it, those aren't the ones that seem to to really kind of lead the way. It, it seems to me from the conversations I've been having that the ones that are are building solutions that are end to end focus on a particular vertical and problem are the ones that are really uh, uh, acquiring the attention of buyers because they're able to relate and and have more domain um, understanding to to speak to them uh, and sell to them. And that's what I think is really interesting to kind of see the progression of the industry. Yeah. And those um, channels, the the generic term being used is advisor, but that covers a whole multitude of things. But the 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 point is they um, they have a close relationship with the with the customer and they understand pain points and they're responsible for kind of pulling the solutions together. Co-selling seems to be the word of the the conference. Everybody's talking about co-selling, and that writ large in IoT, right? For all the reasons you just just mentioned, you've got hardware, you've got connectivity, it's just you, uh, you've got applications, right? You've got that, you've got various other uh, uh, other end. and how do you actually turn that into a, into a product? And this, this idea of co-selling with between the various players, I think it's that's interesting. So as we wrap up here, let me ask you, at, at going to these two events and the other work that you do on a daily basis, what should the audience be thinking about, looking forward to, kind of expecting as we get into the second quarter of, of this new year? Well, I think the Mobile World Congress one is always a good bellwether for that. And I might talk a little bit about that if I, if I may. So there's some, um, some really interesting trends came through from, from that. You know, I always go off to that show and have a, a view of, of how the space uh, sits and then after all of those conversations in all of those meeting rooms and all those stands there's there's a whole bunch of uh, different ways of thinking about the place come, come out um one is around um customization being a killer right so try try to render your offering into something that's a bit more productized that doesn't need customization and don't kind of always be um We'd be saying yes to the the customer, um, every every possible opportunity. So that was a kind of interesting uh, 
interesting take whether there's anything to uh, to apply to any given company's uh, business models is a, is another one. Um, 5G starts to look pretty interesting um, at about now. The challenge with 5G always was that there was a lot of promise around it, but actually in reality, no one really, or very few companies actually really deployed 5G yet because it was the access network with 5G, but the core network wasn't 5G. Uh, and that meant that a whole load of the functionality that really looks interesting around the programmability of the network and doing network slices and guarantees on connectivity and so on weren't really available, but they really are starting to come online uh, now. So that's starting to look, look pretty interesting. And actually, as a, as a side note, I kind of think that the, um, a lot of the learnings that have been done on the private network side of things can be actually ported over into the, into the support for 5G applications on the public network. Um, I've ne- never been a massive believer in the, in the dedicated stamp private network, but just the economics are incredible. Um, but there have been a lot of learnings on how you support the various 5G applications. So that's kind of, uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, another big, um, the big topic was around eSIM, everybody wanted to talk about eSIM, and very specifically the SGP32 standard that just came out, the, the GSM Association. And a lot of question marks about, okay, fine. kind of now we've got to grips with what this technology looks like. It's quite an interesting one. It allows you to remotely, the customer to remotely manage uh, what the SIM profile is on the on the device, you don't need to go through the carrier and you don't need direct access to the device. So that was, those were the two, uh, approaches that previously were uh, enacted. A couple of other technologies called SGP2 and SGP22. So either you needed to go to the carrier and say, can you do this for me? Or you needed to go to the, uh, actually have the device in front of you and, uh, and manage it, uh, directly. But now you can do that. Remotely, that's kind of kind of interesting, okay, and and sort of evolves the technology and and and, and improves it. And there's a couple of other improvements in in there as well. No need to support SMS, so certain technologies and support for some of the low power or the more constrained uh, protocols and and so on. But the issue isn't the technology. The issue is what are the business models that like for this? Okay, so just because I can move my connections from one operator to another operator. Should I, do I have the commercial relationships with multiple operators? What happens to all the backend systems when I make that switch across? This is non-trivial stuff. And the conclusion is actually this maybe really needs to be done as a, as a managed service. And if it needs to be done as a managed service, it maybe doesn't look that different from the other technologies that, that already existed. There may, may not be that many companies who are actually able to make those changes and do those to, to, um, and, and kind of handle that uh, technology directly themselves. So that was pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I, um, I traveled over to, to Barcelona by train from, from the UK this year, and I set myself the task on the, uh, on the Paris to Barcelona leg of that, of that journey, six and a half hours on the train. I thought, okay, sit there with a blank piece of paper and work out what the, uh, what the commercial implications are of that as a, as a new emerging uh, technology. And I never quite got to the, the end of it, but we're, we're kind of working through what it, what it looks like. And I think I've, uh, I've kind of got, got a hand on it now. And it looks like there's a new function to be performed, but it's probably done as a managed service and, and handled by players who kind of sits adjacent to this, whether it's a connectivity provider or a SIM vendor or a platform provider. Or whatever, but that's certainly something that's there's a lot of people focus their their attention this, uh, this year. Oh, sorry, this quarter. I should also mention uh, you spoke to Paul Bradley at Keegan about uh, SGP forty. Well, actually, more specifically, more broadly, you spoke to him about in factory profile provisioning, for which there is also a standard coming uh, through that same process within the, the GSMA for uh, that. But, in factory profile provisioning, pretty interesting to me. This is the idea that 
you manage the SIM profile within the, the factory. The, the manufacturer of a device can actually handle that SIM provisioning uh, uh, approach. Now, he'll have gone into it in, in, in way more detail. And he may have mentioned that we, uh, we published a, a white paper uh, between Keegan and, and, and Transform Insights looking at this IFPP uh, space. But it's very uh, interesting um, uh, additional approach to this SIM uh, provisioning uh, requirement and one that's great news for anybody who's using low power devices who looking at doing in, pro, in, in field provisioning where they're going to burn through a whole load of the battery uh, just doing that initial bootstrapping and, and, and management of that initial profile selection. Whereas if you do it in the factory, great, you can then push that device out for a 100% battery rather than whatever it ends up being once it's you have to do that in the field. So it's an interesting one, but he'll have talked about it much more eloquently than I have, have and in much more detail than I have, I'm sure. But um, any, anybody who didn't catch that episode of the, yeah, I'm doing your job for you now. Anyone who didn't catch that episode of the IoT for All podcast, I, re- I recommend taking, taking a look at that one. Yeah, we, we spoke um, as listening to this, as the episode came out probably a week before this, but that was something we covered towards the end of the conversation, uh, talking about the provisioning and, and how that kind of changes when for OEMs now versus kind of how it was done in the past. But all really good stuff. Um, it seems like these events were kind of overall a success, l- learned a good, good bit, kind of got a pulse on, on what's going on. The Channel Partners is a interesting event that I might look at going to next year. It's, it's one we've never been to. Um, but you, you made a good point. There's a lot of people and they ask us the same kind of questions is what events should we go to to do X, Y, and Z, whether it's find partnerships to sell into to specific verticals, and my answer is very similar. It's like if you're looking for partners, the horizontal events are usually better for that. If you're looking for um, uh, customers in a specific vertical, the trade shows are probably better for that. Um, just depends on kind of making sure you find the right ones to go to. But channel partners, like you said, sounds like it really sits right in between them. So it'd be something that we'll have to explore looking at um, next year for sure. T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, we're all there. Core with it, iBasis, uh, Telnix, who I mentioned earlier. There were you know, there was some. A decent chunk of, of IoT players. One other thing, actually, uh, I didn't mention yet, and actually I should do um, around uh, key trends that are, that are happening right about now is around uh, regulation and compliance. And interestingly, this didn't really come up very much during the conversations in, in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress. And I really expected it to, because there is a... Um, one of the things that I said back at the start of the year, we put out these transition topics where we talked about all of the, all the interesting stuff that's going on in the, um, in the IoT space for, for the next 12, 12 months. One of those was regulation. And I actually put that as my, my number one thing that there is a lot of polarization happening in terms of the, how you, uh, how the world of IoT is regulated. So you're getting US and EU and China and how you, um, how you manage the various regulatory challenges associated with working in each one of those is becoming a more, uh, more challenging thing. Now it's not impossible to navigate, but it does mean that there's a, there's an additional compliance obligation on just about every company in the, uh, in the IoT space. But no one was really talking about that very much in, in Barcelona, which I thought was, was quite interesting. So. You know, norm, normally, I go in there and I um, come. I come back with my my conclusions about things, which are sort of pretty similar to what my 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 thinking about it was going in. Because when I'm thinking about going in, tends to be things I talk to people about. But um, regulation is one of those, and I'm going into the event thinking this is pretty, and actually come out thinking maybe maybe no one thinks this is a big deal, but actually we very much do. Uh, you know, you've got things like. Um, the U.S. Cloud Act and the potential conflict that has with some of the EU regulations about what you can and can't do with with uh, customer data, because the Cloud Act puts some obligations on U.S. companies to share data with U.S. agencies, regardless of where it's generated in the world. And the EU regulations say, no, you definitely can't do that. And there's a there's kind of a friction uh, that, that exists within, within that. Uh, and there's, you know, there's probably six or seven other examples of, of regulatory things that are kind of bubbling up just just right now. So that's that's kind of a thing uh, want to, to note that just that people aren't 
people weren't really talking about it that uh, that much. So. For audience who wants to kind of follow up with questions, learn more about the the work you all do, digest the content you put out. I'm sure you're going to put out content after you get back from these events. Uh, what's the best way that that they can kind of stay in touch and and follow along? You can check us out at transformerinsights.com. That's transformer with an A. Uh, there's a blog, uh, a bunch of uh, other free content that's available on the on the site. In fact, there is already a Mobile World Congress blog post from me, um, and I will doubtless be doing something based on my furious notes taking at the uh, at the Channel Partners event over the last couple of days. Uh, I will be compiling some thoughts on what the implications of all this stuff are. For for IoT and I'll be putting some stuff out about that. Well, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that and get it out to our audience when it comes out too and spread it around. Um, but Matt, as always, thank you so much for being here. I'm sure we'll talk in, in a few months and kind of just keep the the audience abreast of what's going on in the space. So uh, really appreciate your time. I know you're you're out west a little early, but but appreciate you jumping on and, and chatting with, with us today. No problem at all. Thanks, Ryan.